from an embryo that grew a mouse with rat brain growing inside it. Here's the paper, Generation of Rat Forebrain Tissues in Mice. And the forebrain is a lot of the brain. It's the cortex, it's the hippocampus, it's the part of the brain that's on top. And they got it to be almost completely made of rat tissue. The way they did this was they started with a blastocyst, which is an early embryonic stage, and they used gene knockout. So they turned off a certain gene that's responsible for developing the forebrain. And instead of the normal mouse forebrain developing, they squirted in some stem cells from a rat. Those rat stem cells filled in the gaps and the rat brain grew inside of this mouse. So let's see how that works. Here's the way blastocyst complementation has worked in the past. They knock out a gene that's responsible for developing a pancreas, and this blastocyst with a knocked out gene is going to grow into a sad mouse pup that doesn't have a pancreas and isn't going to do so great. But if they squirt in some embryonic stem cells from a different mouse, for example, the other mouse cells are going to fill in the gap and grow a pancreas for that mouse. So you have blastocyst complementation, where you're complementing it with some new stem cells to grow that organ. A step beyond that is interspecies blastocyst complementation, and this is where you take the stem cells from a different species, like a rat, and you grow the organ inside of the mouse. And this has been done too with the pancreas and thymus and, and other tissues. But what's never been done before is interspecies blastocyst complementation for any brain tissues. But the problem with the brain is we don't already know what gene to knock out. They had to develop a new technique called a CCBC, or C-CRISPR-based blastocyst complementation. And they use some CRISPR technology to figure out what gene to knock out so that the forebrain wouldn't grow. And then they could try the interspecies blastocyst complementation with some brain tissue. Now they had some candidate genes, so we know that when the head is forming, there's a bunch of genes in this whole cascading process that are involved. So they tried all seven of these genes and tried to figure out if we knock these out, is that going to make it so the forebrain doesn't develop? And once they figure out what gene to knock out, they can see if they can regrow that forebrain using stem cells from another species. Here's the wild type. This is not genetically modified, just like a mouse you'd see in the wild after a bunch of generations of being bred in the lab. But wild type means no genetic modification. And they grew all three parts of the brain, hindbrain, midbrain, and forebrain. But when they knocked out this gene, we see a hindbrain, a midbrain, no forebrain. When we knock out this gene, SX1, we see a hindbrain, a midbrain, and no forebrain. So they were able to knock out these genes and it successfully turned off forebrain development. So the next step was to see if they could then add some stem cells from a different mouse into those blastocysts and grow the forebrain even though they have these genes knocked out. And it worked. Let's focus on this HESX1 because that's the one they end up using. We just saw that when you knock out HESX1, the forebrain doesn't develop. We saw that right here. Look, no forebrain. But when you take HESX1 knockout blastocyst and you complement it with some mouse embryonic stem cells, all of a sudden you see the forebrain again. So we have these mice, they have a gene knocked out so they won't develop a forebrain. We squirt in some mouse embryonic stem cells and the forebrain grows. So this raises the question, was that forebrain made out of those injected stem cells? The researchers wanted to make sure. So what they did is they labeled the donor cells, the embryonic stem cells from the other mouse, with TD tomato, which is going to make them glow red. And they labeled the original mouse embryo cells as green. So as it develops, we'll be able to see which cells are red and which cells are green so we can figure out where each cell came from. And we can see, look, we got a bunch of green cells and a bunch of red cells when they grow up. So the cells are mixing, going throughout their entire body. But what about this forebrain that only developed when they added the embryonic stem cells? On the top row, we can see what happens when we take a wild-type mouse that's going to grow a forebrain anyway, and we add some mouse embryonic stem cells. We can see here the cortex is made of some green cells and some red cells. So it's a mixture of the original mouse cells from the wild-type mouse and the donor mouse stem cells. But in the mouse where we knock out HESX1, so it's not going to grow a forebrain unless we add the stem cells, and then we do add the stem cells, we see almost no green cells there. 
and almost all red cells in the cortex. So it looks like the new cortex that they grow is made almost entirely out of cells from the donor mouse. Almost no cells from the original blastocyst made it into the forebrain. So on to the exciting part, the interspecies blastocyst complementation. So here, it's going to be a really similar process, but instead of squirting in mouse embryonic stem cells, they're going to use rat embryonic stem cells. So let's see how these rats held up. Or mice, sorry, I'm starting to get confused, because they're kind of both. So here's two different mouse pups that both have rat embryonic stem cells. One is wild type, and here it is growing up to be a wild type mouse with some rat cells in it. And here is a Hess X1 knockout mouse with some rat embryonic stem cells. And here it is at 20 months, a healthy adult, looking a little rough, but uh, what do you expect? It's got a forebrain gene knockout and it's got a bunch of rat cells. So let's see how, it, how its brain looks. So on the top, we have the wild type mouse with the rat embryonic stem cells, and they have some rat stem cell derived cells in their cortex and hippocampus, but not too many, especially when we compare it to the Hess X1 knockout mouse. Here we see the rat embryonic stem cells all over the forebrain. There's a ton in the cortex, a ton in the hippocampus. There's some in the midbrain, but when we knock out Hess X1, cortex and hippocampus aren't going to develop on their own, and the gaps are filled in by these red rat embryonic stem cells. So there's clearly a bunch of rat-based brain cells inside of this mouse. Next, they wanted to see how well integrated they were. Would the rat stem cells create neurons that would functionally integrate into the rest of the mouse's brain? So to figure that out, they squirted some more of this staining stuff into this anterior lateral motor cortex, and they just wanted to see how far these cells had penetrated into the rest of the brain. And they found that it was quite far. So here we can see these cells sending projections that make it into the thalamus and the superior colliculus and even the medulla way deep in this mouse's brain. So um, the cells do look like they are integrating super deeply. Next, they wanted to see if they function normally, so they did some electrophysiological recordings. So in response to a current, you've got the rat-based cells responding like this. You've got the mouse-based cells responding like this, all looking pretty normal. One of the weird things about these hybrids is just how normal they seem. Here we see the body weight curve, which is just about identical for everything from the wild type mice with mouse cells to the forebrain knockout mice with rat cells, all show a similar body weight curve. And normally when you look at cortex, there's six layers of cortex that all have slightly different um, cellular and chemical makeup. And they find that these are pretty consistent across all the different types of hybrids that they produced. Not only were these animals physically normal, but they also didn't seem any different on cognitive tests. So they used a bunch of standard tests, the Morris water maze, open field test, and some contextual fear conditioning, and they didn't show any differences between the different types of hybrids, which we can see right here. So performance on these cognitive tests was pretty normal. I don't know why they didn't compare these with wild type animals. They only compared the various different types of hybrids that they had, but all the hybrids seem to do about the same on these cognitive tests. So their takeaway from this is that this suggests normal functioning of the reconstituted forebrains. One potential problem that they had is that as the development progressed, the overall chimeric contribution of the rat cells, so the amount of cells that were from the rat, decreased over time from about 60% to about 20% by embryonic day 17.5. And also, even in the forebrain, it went from being almost completely made of rat cells to only about 60% rat cells by day 15.5. So it does seem like the integration is not complete and the method that they derived is best for the very early stages of embryonic development. One of the coolest things they found in this study, they found when they started looking at the timeline of development for these different types of cells. Now normally, the rat cells develop about two days slower. So that would obviously create a problem if you're trying to grow a brain and your brain is developing a little slower than the rest of the body. But they didn't see this delay in the forebrain knockout mouse embryos with the rat embryonic stem cells. It looks like the rat embryonic stem cells caught up to the rest of the developing mouse or the mouse sent some sort of cellular messages telling the rats to, hey, speed it up. You have to develop just as fast as the rest of the mouse cells. 
So these results suggest that, similar to body and organ size, the development of the rat brain tissues in rat mouse chimeras is synchronized with the mouse host. Even though the injected rat embryonic stem cells are taking cues from the mouse in terms of the pace of their development, they're keeping up with the rest of the developing mouse, but they still left some of their unique rat signature on the brain. They found that the neurons that came from these rat embryonic stem cells, in terms of their transcriptome, in terms of the genes they expressed, they actually looked more like wild-type rats. This is called a cell autonomous mechanism, which means the cells themselves are dictating what they do rather than just taking cues from the rest of the mouse environment around them. So like just about everything else in biology, there's some nature and some nurture going on when you make a brain hybrid. So what can we take away from this? Well, one thing, we anticipate that the CCBC platform can be broadly applied to a wide range of organs, paving the way for utilizing large animals as hosts in blastocyst complementation experiments involving human cells. I don't know how large they're talking about here. I don't know, maybe a cow? Human lungs in it? Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, this approach has the potential to greatly expand our understanding of organ development, regeneration, and diseases, as well as address the global shortage of donor organs for transplantation. This is a big problem. It seems a little creepy thinking about growing human organs in livestock and stuff, but there's a lot of people who need organs who don't have them, so maybe they'll get them from a cow, thanks to CCBC. We'll see. One limitation of this study is that they didn't totally replace the forebrain with rat cells. Even at the very beginning, there were a few mouse cells in the forebrain, and over time, the proportion of donor cells went lower and lower. So this could be a problem if they're trying to use this to actually generate, say, human organs for transplantation. The last limitation they point to is a lack of direct evidence for functional connectivity between rat and mouse neurons within the chimeric brains. They did show a bunch of these rat and mouse neurons coexisting with each other. They showed that they were all responsive and acted pretty normal, but they didn't have direct evidence that the rat and mouse neurons were actively communicating with each other. But there's another study that I will cover in an upcoming video that does show this. So Throsch et al. do show some functional connectivity between rat and mouse neurons in a brain just like this. So stay tuned for that. And if you don't want to get left behind when the rat brain chimeras take over, check out our sponsor, Brilliant. They have a bunch of interactive lessons to give you a strong foundation in scientific thinking, and it's all built from the bottom up. That's always my goal with teaching. If you know the first principles, everything makes so much more sense when it all comes together. Have you ever been reading something and you zone out for a whole page before you even realize you weren't paying attention? Not with Brilliant. And you can do them from your phone in bite-sized chunks, even if you only have a few minutes. A lot of phone games claim they train your brain, but the skills you learn don't really generalize beyond the game itself. Brilliant's exercises are designed by experts to actually teach you things and apply them to real-world situations. Try Brilliant free for 30 days at brilliant.org IHM. That'll also get you 20% off an annual subscription. That's brilliant.org slash IHM for a free 30 days. Thanks for watching.